All right, uh, we're going to get ready to continue on. Dr. Cigar is waiting in the uh, wings over here. We're going to talk about uh, pulmonary hypertension and adult congenital heart disease and medical treatment, timing of transplantation. Dr. Cigar is an associate professor of medicine and one of the integral people in our pulmonary hypertension uh, group and uh, heart lung transplant group. Uh, come on up. Come on down. <laughs> Good to see you. So first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, thank, you, thank Jamil and the team and Dr. Child and every, all the congenital folks and Pam and everyone that put this together. Uh, this is an outstanding uh, endeavor and a great venue. Um, I was asked to uh, talk about pulmonary hypertension. I'm one of the pulmonologists, so don't get angry with me if you see, see things that don't make sense from a cardiology perspective. I, I do my best. I learn from these guys, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of the team. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pulmonary hypertension in the 15 minutes. It's a little bit of a tough topic to talk about in such a short time, but we'll, we'll get it done. So I put this really big because it's really important to understand that the definition is a hemodynamic one. You guys are familiar with it. Uh, a resting mean PA pressure of greater than or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury. Again, a not, not a systolic pressure, but a mean pressure. The left-sided filling pressure has to be normal, either by wedge or LV end diastolic pressure, and the pulmonary vascular resistance has to be elevated. So once we are familiar with that, let's jump into the outline. We're going to talk a little bit about the classification. This was reclassified uh, in the 2013 uh, NICE uh, World Symposium meeting, which occurs every four years. We'll talk a bit about the epidemiology of PAH, uh, which I actually learned a lot about uh, in preparation for this talk. This is a very heterogeneous group, I don't have to tell you, of defects, which are interestingly at variable risk for PAH. The PAH that complicates this uh, condition uh, worsens morbidi morbidity and mortality. This is a general theme for pulmonary hypertension when it complicates just about any disease, whether it's a lung disease, a heart disease, or frankly, in its idiopathic variety, it has a very poor prognosis. Uh, the therapies, uh, medical, that may improve survival, of course, that would be added to hybrid therapies, catheter-based therapies, and surgical therapies. Some of the guidelines currently for therapy and shunt closure, I think there's been a big push in the, in the last several years for shunt closure, and I think we sort of want to de-emphasize that um, perhaps uh, moving forward, and we'll talk about why. And then a little couple slides on lung and heart-lung transplantation, which has a, I would argue, a minor role in this disease process. So <clears throat> the first thing to note is that you can have pulmonary hypertension either from a venous standpoint or an arterial standpoint. We're talking about pulmonary arterial hypertension. So for for the shown complexes and the other diseases that end up with left heart failure, we're not going to be discussing that. Depending on the lesion, you can have either uh, left, right, or biventricular dysfunction, and really making sure that you have a pulmonary vascular resistance issue um, first, and then managing that as PAH uh, is really important and impacts our management. So this is the new classification system that came out um, in 2000, actually 2009. Um, and was propagated in 2013. Before this, I have to admit, I, I had a lot of trouble myself sort of understanding you know, where things fit, and this was helpful for me. As everyone knows, Eisenmenger's is the, really the um, end, end product, if you will, or the worst on the spectrum of PAH is the worst um, you know, sort of clinical manifestation of PAH. And then we have PAH associated with systemic uh, to pulmonary shunts where it's not quite um, cyanotic, um, and there's still a systemic to pulmonary shunt that's uh, prevalent, and the pulmonary vascular resistance may not be as high as what you see in Eisenmenger's. And then there's this entity of PH with small defects. I learned this from Dr. Childs here when I was a fellow, uh, and Jamil, which, which, which is just that, you know, listen, you can have um, a PAH that acts like an idiopathic variety, but it just happens to have an ASD. Um, and the ASD doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's driving the clinical presentation. Interestingly, this group of patients, whether it's ASD or VSD, in terms of septal defects, uh, acts very similar to the idiopathic PAH variety. And as you all know, the idiopathic PAH prognosis is extremely poor, much poorer than what you see in standard Eisenmenger syndrome. And then there's PAH after corrective surgery. So these are individuals who had 
sometimes appropriate closures. Uh, by appropriate, I mean early in life, and everything was done, I think, by anyone's standard effectively and appropriately. But despite that, they go on to develop uh, a picture that's very compatible with PAH um, in the future. So those are the four sort of, uh, um, sort of definitions. I just threw this slide in mostly just to say that this is extremely complex. I don't have to tell you. I, my head was hurting when I, when I was writing this, this set of uh, um, this presentation. Honestly, my, um, I, I haven't gotten much sleep in the last few weeks when Jamil asked me to do this because I actually wanted to try to take a stab at some of this stuff. So I started reading all this stuff, and before I knew it, I was in crazy articles that I had no idea what was going on. But anyway, so this is sort of the breakdown. And what I learned from this is that the ones in the yellow font are really at higher risk for PAH. And um, what's interesting is that the majority of what we're going to end up seeing are actually the simple defects. I mean, the majority of it. Of course, there's a lot of complex congenital heart disease. And unfortunately for me, that's what we end up seeing a lot of it at, at UCLA. Um, but a lot of what, if you take the whole pie, a lot of what you're going to see are simple defects that lead to Eisenmangers and PAH. And this, is really, this really epitomizes that this is the Dutch registry, which I think was a, a really nice um, uh, um, registry approach. They basically defined the population at risk. And so if you see at the bottom there, they had a total of uh, 2,389 2, patients who had any one of the above defects. And they basically said all those patients, all that whole N, was at risk for PAH given their congenital defect. However, of those, only 248 actually developed PAH. Um, which meant it was a 10% prevalence. So in general, it's fair to say that PAH complicates congenital heart disease about 10% in terms of prevalence. And if you look at the, the group here, you can see that most of this is driven by atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects in sheer number. Uh, but if you look at percent of patients who develop PAH, things like atrial ventricular septal defect or aerial pulmonary window, you know, much higher percentages of those patients will actually get PAH, but the absolute number is going to be fairly low. Um, and then if you look at the bottom here, in this registry, they actually had 5,970 patients with congenital heart disease, and of those, 2,389 were at risk. So the whole population was almost 6,000, and of those, only 4.2. So if you look at a whole population of congenital heart disease, only 4.2% of them will actually have PAH. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a majority, but it's not an insignificant minority. And then of that group, in, in the PAH group of the 248, the median age was 38, so they tend to be younger, presenting younger. They're mostly female predominant, and this is true really of all PAH, tends to be a a female predominant disease, and a lot of research is done in terms of the what they call the estrogen paradox in PAH, in terms of why females get it more than males. Eisenmangers of those were 58%, so you have Eisenmangers PAH, and then you have non-Eisenmangers PAH, and only 3% had a previously closed defect. This is the U.S. registry, the largest registry of PAH ever done in the United States. It amounted at the end to about 3,500 patients, but at the 2,500 cut, you can see here that half the pie is usually idiopathic PAH, and the other half is associated conditions. And of that, of the associated conditions, 20% is congenital heart disease. So if you take all PAH in the U.S., essentially, at, this was at university centers, about 10% of all of it will be congenital heart disease. So it's about one-tenth one of what we see. This is just a simple slide to show the impact of PAH on long-term outcome by age in congenital heart disease. Again, this included venous pulmonary hypertension. This is almost 40,000 people uh, in this study, and just a simple graph showing that you know, pulmonary hypertension certainly impacts the, um, uh, the, the cumulative survival. So this is uh, based out of the Montreal uh, Congenital Heart Disease Database. And then going into the morbidity, this is again from the Dutch registry showing that if you classify the patients by New York Heart Association classification, it's, there's a clear relationship between class one through four and the degree of pulmonary hypertension simply by mean PA pressure. So again, functional class is uh, again uh, affected by the mean pulmonary artery pressure. Um, this is the study out of the Brompton, uh, again focusing more on this morbidity and functional or dysfunction of these patients. This looked at significance of peak VO2 in adult congenital heart disease. This is 335 patients. It was 13% of this cohort had PAH. And what was interesting was this, that they actually had age-matched controls. I put them up there for you, the VO2. And I also put in the 
reduced ejection heart failure controls as well. And you can see where their VO2s ended up. And you get a, feel, you get a picture there that the Eisenmenger patients and the complex congenitals have VO2s that are very similar to a reduced ejection fraction heart failure. These were EFs of less than 35%. Some of them were ischemic, some of them were dilated. Um, and so that gives you an idea. And then what was even more interesting was if you break, if you just put a line down at 20, there was not a single case of PAH um, that actually had a VO2 above 20. Remember, this is not percent predicted, this is actual VO2. And all the PAH was less than 20 mils per kilogram per minute. So again, they're dysfunctional, I think is, is, is the bottom line. When they actually went back to the multivariate analysis, they found that PAH was in fact an independent predictor of, um, of uh, uh, loss of VO2. In addition, so was forced vital capacity. And, and when I get consults uh, at UCLA for congenital heart disease, one of the things I often find, although I don't think it's well reported, is the pulmonary dysfunction of these patients. Um, that you can often find airway disease, small airway disease, and often um, what we also find is just compression of uh, the, the bronchi, large bronchi and small bronchi, just from large uh, pulmonary artery uh, and their tributaries. Uh, and I think this can play a role in their functional, I should say their dysfunction uh, in terms of exertional capacity. So uh, this again, just going home with the, uh, with the morbidity of these patients, a lot more mortality, a lot more morbidity, and a lot longer hospitalizations. This is a serious problem, and we need to figure out how to deal with this um, in a better way. Now, <clears throat> I looked through a whole bunch of articles, and what I was trying to find out was what exactly has happened to the mortality in Eisenmengers over the years. And, and, and in PAH, um, what I realized was that, um, in, 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 again, we're focusing on PAH, and most of the data that's out there in PAH is in Eisenmengers. It, there's very little in all the other sort of congenital defects. And what these guys did in Germany was they actually did a systematic review of the literature. And I, 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 would, be, I, would, be, I would be remiss if I didn't show you this. And what they actually found was that a lot of the studies that have been done since the 60s have suggested that the Eisenmenger essentially the survival at 10 years, let's say, has improved over time since the 60s. And what they did in this German report, which was very elegant, is they went back and actually figured out that there was this huge issue with immortal time bias. And what they, went, what they found essentially was that since the 60s, according to them, in their very elegant analysis, there was only a 30 to 40 percent mortality, or there's a 30 to 40 percent mortality at 10 years in naive, untreated Eisenmengers, which essentially has not changed since the 60s. When they, when they vetted all the studies, there were seven studies that they vetted into this. I don't know how you guys feel about that. They were surprised to see that because they thought heart failure management improved. They thought there was improvement in lack of, you know, stopping the use of Coumadin and aspirin unnecessarily, you know, improving bleeds, et cetera. But they were shocked to see that this was really unchanged over the years. And when they went back to their community experience in the same report, look at, look at their mortality. These were non-tertiary centers and doing community practice in adult congenital heart disease. They had a 66% tenure mortality, again, making the case for management in a multidisciplinary effort uh, at tertiary centers. So going on to therapy in these patients, you have pharmacologic therapies, which I'm going to focus on. You have catheter-based therapies, which are are just amazing and, and, and uh, interesting, I should say, and, and, and you know, Dr. Abelhost and, has, and, and the team has uh, taught me a lot in that regard. There are surgical approaches, which uh, Dr. Lax has pioneered, and there's, uh, you know, very complicated surgical issues, and hybrid therapies, of, of course. So advanced medical therapy for PAH, I'm talking about medication now. There's data now for safety and benefit of all three classes of currently available advanced therapies. That includes endothelin and antagonists, phosphodesterase 5 inhibitors, and prostanoids. Uh, there's a growing role, and I think there's some recent data suggesting that combination therapy in this group of patients may be beneficial. It's, none of this is perfect science. There's no randomized, uh, there's no large randomized placebo-controlled trials. I'll tell you what we got in a second. And there's, of course, unique issues when you're talking about parental delivery, especially from an intravenous standpoint. So when I was a fellow, um, I would occasionally get a consult from this young man right here, and he would say to me, hey, you've got this patient with pulmonary hypertension, and you know, what are you going to do for him? And I said, hey, you know, why don't we just put him on some pulmonary hypertension medication? And he's like, what are you, what are you kidding me? They're going to get hypoxic. They're, they're definitely going to get a hypoxic. And I said, well, maybe you're right. I said, we'll just have to see what happens. Anyways, so for that reason, I was very scared to treat him. Uh, but someone was bold enough, and they went ahead and did this study called the Breathe 5 study. 
And there were initial fears uh, from many um, experts in the field that there perhaps would be some systemic vasodilatation. As you know, these drugs are not specific for the pulmonary, for the pulmonary um, vasculature. And this was the first randomized controlled study in Eisenmenger's population. There was 57 patients from 15 centers. They randomized patients two to one to an endothelin antagonist, bocentin versus placebo. They basically showed there was no, the primary endpoint was um, to show that it was non-inferior in terms of oxygenation. So they showed that the drug did not worsen oxygenation. Um, and there was the co-primary endpoint of six-minute walk, and there was a you know, drastic improvement and in, in, in significant improvement, I should say, in the six-minute walk distance. So this was the first study to show that an oral prostanoid, which came out and was approved by the FDA in 2005, actually had relevance um, in con congenital heart disease. And specifically, I want to focus or make sure you understand most of these studies are done with a focus on Eisenmenger's uh, syndrome. <laughs> These are the t only two other randomized trials in Eisenmenger's that I can find. These are double-blind randomized. These are both crossover design studies. This first study by Iverson was a 12-week, so what they did was they put everyone on Bocentin for 12 weeks, and then they did a crossover design using Bocentin and placebo. So everyone got Bocentin for 12 weeks, um, and then they crossovered in a placebo control fashion for, with sildenafil. And in that study, sildenafil did not add benefit to Bocentin. Um, there's several other sort of open label studies and, and um, you know, reports of this combination working, but this is the only one that actually was randomized and it was negative and it's food for thought. Um, this other study was 28 patients with Eisenmenger's, same design, but these patients actually were placebo versus um, Tadalafil. So this wasn't everyone got upfront therapy. This actually was placebo versus Tadalafil in a crossover design and Tadalafil actually improved functional class, hemodynamic six minute walk and oxygenation. So there's some data there for a PD-5 inhibitor. Um, so just going now to mortality uh, in terms of what if these drugs done for Eisenmenger's in terms of sort of changing or perhaps adjusting or moving the survival curve. If you look here on the left, that's the unadjusted experience at the Brompton for Eisenmenger's patients treated with PAH therapies. You can see 66% were on PAH therapy, 12% on combination, and unadjusted on the left is pretty impressive. Uh, the yellow line is PAH treated therapies. When you adjusted the analysis, of course, it was just the same, if not a little bit better, and you can see a major difference in Eisenmenger's survival um, in the Brompton experience on PAH therapies. I don't think that's subtle. And then to bring that home, this is a very nice paper that just came out, uh, or that came out actually in 2014. This is the Italian experience. What they did that was different was they included not just Eisenmenger's, but all four groups and really looked at the survival curves. And this goes back to um, uh, corrected defects. And I just want to point a couple things out here. One is that the 20-year survival in the, in the Italian experience, this is, this is right heart catheterization proven PAH even if that catheterization was done at a referral, referring facility. So they went back and did their homework, and they t t said time zero was right heart catheterization PAH. The Eisenmenger's group at 20 years had an 87% survival, with 78% on PAH therapy and 66% of those on combination. What they also found was that the systemic to pulmonary shunts there, you can see, had a very similar survival at 20 years, and the corrected defects at 20 years had a 36% had a survival, much different from the other two groups. You probably wouldn't expect that, since in that group, the Eisenmengers, the Eisenmengers had the worst hemodynamics, worst functional class, worst exercise capacity, yet they had the best survival. And what's even, what's even as interesting is if you look at the uh, small defects the small defects group, you know, the people with an incidental ASD, you know, small ASD, small VSD, they had a 15-year, 66% survival. So, and, and I just put in their, 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 um, their contemporary idiopathic PAH cohort, just to remind everyone that the 15-year idiopathic PAH cohort on therapy had a 38% 15-year survival. So idiopathic PAH is what, you know, is the worst actor. But what they found in this study was that corrected defects and small defects seem to have the worst survival, even though they, it would seem like that wouldn't be the case. And there's all kinds of postulates as to why that may happen. I'm not going to get into it, but I think this proves or sort of supports the concept that you know, the Eisenmenger heart is a very different heart in terms of how it deals with PAH um, in general. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> 
So here's some general statements regarding PAH in the setting of Eisenmangers. After accounting for a moral bias, there's about a 60 to 70 percent survival at 10 years for Eisenmangers. Um, there really hasn't been much of a move since the 1960s. Um, although perhaps with therapies, uh, this is of course naive, right, not on therapy. There's a decreased uh, Eisenmenger survival in the community-based practice, which lends credence to the fact that we should be doing more at, at a multidisciplinary tertiary level, um, and this appears to be related to PAH therapies. Uh, lines of evidence suggest that the benefits of PAH therapy actually may wane over time, so it's not a cure. It's, 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 it's helping the situation, but it's not going to cure the problem. It's the same thing with idiopathic PAH. There's a role for combination therapy, and you may consider PAH therapy in place of other heart failure medications. This was a big point in a lot of the articles, which is that, look, a lot of these patients, as you know, die of arrhythmias and heart failure and spontaneous bleeding, et cetera, and heart failure management, as you know, uses drugs that may compromise systemic blood pressure. Um, and that may, may take away your interest or your you know, uh, comfort, if you will, in using PAH therapies. But perhaps, uh, one, perhaps maybe they should be on PAH therapies if they have PAH over the quote unquote heart failure medications. One has to think about pros and cons of, of um, you know, what's actually limiting their survival more. This is the current guidelines. This is all that there is for congenital heart disease. These are the recommendations. Um, basically, it says use Bocentin, um, and there's really nothing else that they can really comment on. As you know, they classify levels of evidence, you know, large randomized controlled trial, non-randomized trials, you know, expert consensus, et cetera. And they have some other recommendations uh, for other drugs. Um, they talk about anticoagulation, you know, only being used in certain circumstances, supplemental oxygen only in cir certain circumstances, and the role of calcium channel blockers is zero. Um, now, let's talk about shunt closure. Um, so this is the current guidelines. This was published in 2016 by the ERS, uh, the European Respiratory Society, and the um, European Society of Cardiology. This basically states that you may consider shunt closure, and I put the class evidence there. Class 2A means you should consider it. Level C evidence is from consensus, small retrospective studies, and or registries. And you can see the PVR index cutoffs on the left and the pulmonary vascular resistance cutoffs in the middle there. And you can see uh, what's been recommended. And this is from Dr. Abelhosen's paper, and I think it, it's, it goes to the, to the point that each, perhaps each uh, defect should be treated a little bit differently in terms of when you close it, but some of the things that should remain the same are that the QPQS should always be above one and a half if you're going to consider this, and you want to consider the PAP having to be less than two-thirds of the systemic um, PAP and then less than two, th and the PVR less than two-thirds systemic. So I think the two-thirds, two-thirds rule and the QPQS greater than 1.5 makes a lot of sense. I understand that these are about to be modified by the AHA. Um, um, I'm not, I don't have that uh, data, but I think it's going to look similar to this. I think the other message here is after seeing the data you just saw for corrected defects, right, where the survival is so poor, one has to wonder whether correcting these defects, even if you attain these PVR and PAP goals, whether we treat to closure, always is the best thing for the patient. It may not be the best thing for the patient. And in fact, a lot of times, at the end of the day, we're talking about creating a shunt at the end when they have such bad PAH, right? You know, percutaneous pot shunts um, or, um, you know, opening up a, a PFO, um, you know, with a with, with, with device, et cetera. So I think there's, it's a very interesting discussion, and I'm sure, I'm sure the panel here will have a lot of insight. So putting it all together, um, there's, this is also from um, Dr. Abelhosen's paper. I think it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. I would just argue that perhaps the concept of bosentin and sildenafil as a combination, it may not be the best combination of endothelin antagonism and phosphodiesterase 5 antagonism, because actually in the idiopathic pH world, the combination has had some problems as well. Now there's newer ERAs like Massitentin and Ambersentin, and there's also um, Tadalafil, and it seems, at least in the idiopathic, at least in the PAH world, outside of congenital heart disease, that um, uh, this combination of Tadalafil and Ambersentin seems to be very good. Um, and then a couple words on uh, ongoing studies. So there's uh, several studies going on right now uh, looking at uh, the Fontan circulation, use of massatentin in those groups, and UCLA is participating in several of these. And two, thing, two slides on, it, on heart transplant, and, and we'll finish off here. So you can see here 
adult heart lung transplants. There's only about 50 to 100 in this country every year, only 50 to 100 heart lung transplants, the majority of which are for idiopathic pH and congenital heart disease. So those two are the two biggest indications. And I'm just gonna leave you with this data. This data here is heart and lung transplantation. The congenital heart disease median survival is 4.8 years, okay, for all comers who get congenital heart disease uh, heart lung transplants. If you go to this graph, this is lung transplantation, okay, and look at the median survivals for COPD, 6.7 years, cystic fibrosis, 8.9 years. Um, the only thing that correlates with uh, congenital heart disease in heart lung in terms of lung transplant is idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Those are, those are fibrotic lung diseases. So basically you can see that the survival is not as good with heart lung transplant for congenital heart disease. So if you can get away with lung transplant and closure of the defect, that's a better way to go, I think. Um, and then lastly, I want to show you this here. This is congenital heart disease related PAH in the pink line. See that pink line at the bottom? And what you see here is lung transplantation. So these are patients who have congenital heart disease who get lung transplant and then get their congenital defect repaired. Look at their survival. Their median survival is under three years. So this is actually straight out of the 2016 Journal of Heart Lung Transplant Report. The bottom line is that transplantation is probably, we all, we all know it's the last resort, but you really probably, you may not even want to consider it, especially in patients who have a bunch of collaterals, the bleeding risk, the fact that 20 people have been in their chest and there's a lot of adhesions there, you know, behind the sternum. There's a whole bunch of risks associated with this, and I think you need a really, an expert surgeon um, to really consider those kinds of endeavors. And these are the conclusions. They just kind of go through uh, what we just said. Um, I think my time is up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Thank you.